Reginald Gibson had a bad breakup with his girlfriend and mother of his son. When she reported him to the cops, jeopardizing his freedom since he was currently on parole, his rage took over. This is Monsters. Reginald Gibson was from Bainbridge, Georgia, where he had two children with a past girlfriend. He'd been living in Tallahassee for about five years and had been dating a girl there for at least four years. The couple had a three-year-old son together, and shortly after the boy was born, Reginald was arrested on drug charges. He said in his interrogation that he sold drugs to make money for his girlfriend. Yeah, I got arrested. The money went for me. I went and did that for her to put extra money in her pocket. Well, I work, I work that's for she years, man. Kill. That's a job. Right. You're mm -hmm. making money. That's all you're doing. You're trying to support people. I get that. And she ain't care about none of that. That's what I do this time. I get out. I tell my whole life. She don't like that. Because now I don't want to go to the club. I don't smoke while I'm drinking. And she liked that money that you were bringing in before, didn't she? No, she got, she, this time she was up. Mm -hmm. So she had a good job. It ain't about the money, it's about the fame. Yeah. When you go to the club, she go to the club every weekend. Yeah. So she liked to be seen with the niggas in the booth. You know what I'm saying? And I was that, I was that nigga one time. You know what I'm saying? So when I get out and decide to change my life and not do that no more. She fucking out with that. Next nigga going in. And I called her. I pulled up at the nigga house and she coming out the house. And that's when things went the wrong way. Yeah. He spent two and a half years in prison, and when he got out, he told detectives that he didn't smoke or drink at all and stopped going to clubs. He got a job at the local Whataburger, and he said that his girlfriend had a good job. The couple were living together until he caught her with another guy and she broke up with him. Reginald took the breakup hard. He moved into a house with his cousin and he was trying to get back together with his girlfriend. He told investigators that he eventually quit his job due to his feelings, claiming, quote, I met the wrong bitch, end quote. It was reported that on November 26, 2018, Reginald spent the day repeatedly calling his ex-girlfriend. When she wouldn't answer, he had to take a new tactic. The following day, he showed up at the Future Steps Academy, his son's daycare, and told the workers that he wanted to spend time with his son. Daycares usually have a list of people who are approved to interact with or pick up the child that's filled out at the time of enrollment. Reginald was on the list, so employees allowed him into the building to where his son was. The employees of the daycare reported that Reginald did not spend time with his son, though. They claimed that he spent the whole time watching out the window. As soon as his ex-girlfriend's car pulled up, he picked up his son and went outside. The employees reported that Reginald tossed the boy into the car before going over to the driver's side of the car. He pulled out a knife and made his ex-girlfriend move over to the passenger seat, then got into the driver's seat. His ex began to fight with him and managed to get the knife away from him but cut her hand in the process. She threw the knife out the window and Reginald sped away, out of the parking lot. Reginald has a different account of the incident, though. I go to see my son. Mm -hmm. And Terrible had me all away. Yeah. And I said, what I've been told him. Yeah. When I come up, I walk up. She got a knife. But she tell people I had a knife. You come out at the daycare? At the daycare. <coughs> she had a knife for me not being scared of her. I tried to take one. She grabbed a knife with the top one. She already got it at the bottom of her hand and grabbed it. the top to keep me from. That's how it bent. Mm -hmm. And she cut herself. And you're right, it did bend. Right, I don't know. What kind of knife was it? It was a kitchen knife. Okay. But the knife bent. And she cut herself. So she basically was going to press charge on me 
that's what she was saying to me, but telling the lies and saying, because y'all said she pressed charges on me. Mm-hmm. She didn't. She told me that the woman said she called the police, mm-hmm. which she probably did about the night being out there. Mm-hmm. The city yeah. night. I think yeah. she did, yeah. She might have. Okay. Well, um, when she went up there and said that I had the knife, I lost it. Like, He's fairly vague, but according to Reginald, his ex-girlfriend had pulled the knife on him. Was he already in the car? Why did she let him in the car? So, they fight in the car, she pulls a knife, and then she cuts herself trying to keep him from grabbing the knife, and then she throws it out the window? Why would she do that? The story makes no sense. The owner of the daycare came outside as Reginald was speeding off. She didn't call the cops, but called his ex-girlfriend and her mother. Two other employees found the knife in the parking lot later that day, and they did call the cops. They gave the knife to the police. Reginald took his ex-girlfriend to his house, where he held her for three hours. He forced her to give him the password to her phone, and he searched the text messages to see if she was talking to other guys. I mean, they were broken up, so if she was talking to other guys, it really wasn't any of his business. When he found text conversations between her and other men, he punched her and threatened her with another knife. Eventually, his cousin came home and convinced Reginald to let his ex go, and he did. The cousin also did not report any of this to the police. This entire story revolves around Reginald trying to find his ex during the few days after he kidnapped her. He gives the reason at the end of the last clip. It seemed that she had called him at some point, and when she said she was going to press charges, he lost it. He was on parole after being in prison on drug charges. An assault would violate his parole, and he believed he would go back to prison for a minimum of 15 years. I'm not entirely sure what his specific guidelines for violating parole were, but that's what he said he thought. Reginald's ex-girlfriend worked for a company called Conduent. It was a call center that takes calls for Verizon customers. One of the other employees at the same company was a woman named Alyssa Thompson. Alyssa was born April 13, 1992, to Eugene and Judith Thompson. She was 26 years old and had two children. She was working toward making a better life for her and her kids. She was pursuing a master's degree at Florida A&M University and told her father that she was planning to get her Ph.D. On November 29, 2018, Reginald was seen by employees of Conduent walking around the building's parking lot. Though he told detectives during his interrogation that he didn't smoke, the employees claimed they saw him smoking. Investigators later picked up Newport cigarette butts that are believed to be his. He was walking around the parking lot looking for his ex-girlfriend's car. Her car wasn't there, though, because when she called the police to report the kidnap and assault, she also filed for a restraining order. Then she called her employer and told them exactly what had happened, and that she had listed their address as one of the places she needed the order to cover. The company let her work remotely from home so she didn't have to be out of the house as much, which is a very supportive thing to do. Alyssa clocked out of her shift at 12.42 p.m. to go to lunch and left the building. She got into her car, a black Nissan Rogue, waiting for a friend and fellow co-worker to pick up food. Reginald couldn't find his ex-girlfriend's car because, well, it wasn't there. But he does see Alyssa sitting in her car. According to Reginald, he knew Alyssa and they had had a previous sexual relationship. He approached her car and began talking to her. During his interrogation, he said that he asked her to drive him somewhere, but she said she couldn't because she needed to go back to work soon. At that point, it's believed that Reginald threatened her with a knife and told her to move over, but during his interrogation, he claimed that he didn't use a weapon. Did you have a weapon or anything? I didn't use no weapon. We just told her that. And she scooted over. So I ain't on my rap. All I want was a rap, man. Why didn't she get out of the car? Why didn't she get out? Mm-hmm. <coughs> told her not to get out. 
Hmm? So we might have to get out. Yeah. I didn't know the police called on me right then. Employees at Conduent reported seeing her car leave the parking lot about 10 minutes after she clocked out. The friend who was picking up food said he saw her leaving with an unknown male in the driver's seat and just assumed it was an ex-boyfriend or the father of her children. During his interrogation, Reginald said that he didn't take her straight to his house, but didn't say where else they went. Her cell phone pinged near his house for the first time at 1.15 p.m. He forced Alyssa into his house, and he claims they had consensual sex. Unfortunately, Alyssa's not around to deny that claim because it's utter bullshit. You carjack and kidnap a woman, and when you get back to her house, you're telling me she's in the mood to get down with you? I don't think so. After Reginald rapes her, he claims she tried to leave, but couldn't let her. One of my house. Is that where you had sex? Yeah. Your house on 10th Avenue? What, what, what went wrong? She was trying to go back to work. And I knew if she went back to work, she was going to call y'all. You already thought you was going to do 15 years for the other thing. So what'd you do to her? There's blood on the pillow. So there's blood on the pillow. What pillow? They found blood on the pillow. At my house. So why are you asking me these questions? Because I didn't know. To get your side, man, like we've been telling you. <sighs> that blood on that pillow ain't hers. Okay. And that's why I'm asking. He claims that she tried to go back to work, a.k.a. she was trying to escape a kidnap and rape. He obviously couldn't let that happen, so the evidence shows that he strangled her and most likely stabbed her. He claims that the blood on his pillow wasn't hers, but there was also blood on the mattress and the walls by the bed. Believing she was dead, he put Alyssa in the back of her Nissan Rogue and went back into his house and washed the comforter from his bed. It was collected by crime scene investigators who said it had just been washed. Then he proceeded to drive her car, with her body in the back, around town looking for his ex-girlfriend. He said he saw her talking to a man at a nearby apartment complex and then started following her after she left. He claimed that he followed her until she got pulled over by a deputy and he took off. Then he went to a house and can be seen on surveillance tossing Alyssa's phone into the backyard. It's believed that it's the house of some friends, but it's not clear. He ends up breaking into the house and he tells detectives that he was trying to find a gun to use to kill himself. In the surveillance video, which is really good quality, Reginald walks up the concrete path next to the house and throws the phone into the backyard. He is literally right in front of the camera when he does it. You couldn't have got a better shot of him throwing the phone. Then he knocks on the side door that I can only assume that camera is set up to monitor. Then he walks away after a few seconds. The video shows him come back to the door and then walk away again. In another video, he can be seen looking through windows before breaking one of them. He's seen opening the window and climbing inside. It's not known what he did inside the house or if he took anything. After that, he went to the home of his ex-girlfriend and attempted to break in there, but it's unclear whether or not he managed to get inside or not. At some point, between when he put Alyssa in the back of the car and when he ditched the car, Reginald heard a thumping noise coming from the back compartment. It was Alyssa kicking her leg. Reginald took a knife and stabbed her directly in the heart, ensuring that she was indeed dead this time. When Alyssa didn't clock back in after her lunch break, her employer tried to call her but got no answer. But they didn't notify police. I don't think most employers would call the police over that. When Alyssa didn't show up to pick up one of her kids from daycare, the child's father was called, and he began trying to find Alyssa. 
He called her family members, specifically her father, Eugene. He became very concerned when he couldn't get a hold of his daughter and finally called the police to report her missing. Police put out a bulletin about the missing woman and quickly became aware of Reginald as a prime suspect. On November 30th, Reginald drove Alyssa's car with her body still in the back to a parking lot near a pub that Reginald was known to go to. He left the car there and walked about five miles to an apartment complex where he called a friend to pick him up. They went back to his friend's apartment, which just so happened to be the same apartment complex where Alyssa lived. While there, Reginald confessed to his friend that he had killed Alyssa. He told the friend that he, quote, messed up, end quote, and claimed that he had sex with Alyssa and that she was going to make an allegation that he raped her, because he did. After Reginald left his friend's apartment, the friend called police and told them that Reginald was armed with a knife and had admitted to murdering a woman. He also told police that Reginald had admitted to parking Alyssa's Nissan Rogue in a parking lot off of Sharer Road. Reginald was spotted by police walking just a block away from his friend's apartment complex, and he ran from police back to the friend's apartment. He was cornered by the pool, and he yelled at the police to shoot him. He reached into his pockets, trying to make it look like he was retrieving a weapon in an effort to commit suicide by cop. He finally pulled out a knife and threw it on the ground. The cops tased him, and he was successfully apprehended. When the knife was collected, the blade had dried blood on it. Police obtained a search warrant for his home where, in Reginald's bedroom, they found the blood on the pillow, mattress, and wall, the freshly washed comforter, as well as a woman's earring, and the white jacket Alyssa was seen wearing when she left work for lunch. Reginald was taken to the station where he was interrogated by detectives. It takes him a long time before he starts answering questions, but he does admit to a lot of the details, though his answers seemed formulated to minimize his responsibility for the things he had done. He's focused a lot on things outside of the murder he's being questioned about. He isn't quite sure whether his ex-girlfriend, in fact, did file charges against him. So I ain't got no charges on me before this. No, she put charges on him. She did. Like I said, I didn't know anything about that until today when I talked to her. He is also overly focused on who called the police on him before he got arrested. He asked the detectives who called multiple times. They tell him that they don't really know because they didn't take the call, then steer him back to the murder investigation. He asks again, and they tell him the same thing. He sometimes stops talking, and you can tell he's just thinking, and when he snaps out of it, it's to ask detectives who called. They continually have to tell him that it's not important and that he needs to tell them what happened with Alyssa. The family's going to ask. They're going to ask if she suffered. If she suffered? Yeah. I'm going to be in charge with it. You're not going to tell us if she suffered? So for what? When she died. <coughs> you said she didn't make it to the bricks. You said you couldn't let her leave. You told us all this. Of what led to this. Hmm? And I know it hurts. You said what? You told us that you couldn't let her leave. I said I couldn't let her leave. You said you didn't want to leave. You couldn't let her leave. If she called the police. Not. You told us that she never made it down to the bricks, but you were down there in her car. You dished your cell phone over on the hills. He eventually tells them that, if they take him outside to smoke, he'll tell them what happened. Again, I thought he didn't smoke. I guess all bets are off after you get charged with murder. When they come back to the interrogation room and sit down, he looks like he's about to start talking. Then he asks for a lawyer. He talks about all of the events leading up to Alyssa's death, and then he skips to driving her car around, looking for his ex. But he doesn't tell them exactly how she died. Obviously, the autopsy showed that she had been strangled and stabbed. Reginald Gibson is currently awaiting trial at the Leon County Detention Facility. He has been charged with first-degree murder, two counts of kidnapping, carjacking, burglary with assault, armed burglary, burglary, grand theft, 
possession of weapon or ammo by a convicted felon, and resisting arrest. He's being held on a $338,500 bond. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233, or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.